Hey, good morning, FCF. I want to share a little story with you that I've always liked. This mom is at home with her two children. A uh, little boy is seven, little girl is five. Some of you can identify you've been home with your children a lot more than what is normal lately. And so they're playing off somewhere in the house and she can barely hear them, but it's fine. And then all of a sudden the noise level escalates and sure enough, she can tell they're having some sort of an argument. They're yelling, screaming. Next thing you know, the little boy, the little seven-year-old comes running into the room and he's saying, she pulled my hair and spit on me, mom. She pulled my hair and spit on me. Right behind him is the little girl, the little five-year-old girl looking very stern faced. And you know, the mother says, did you do this? And she won't even confess. She's just being stern faced. So the mother says to her, says, I think Satan put something into your mind, little girl. I want you to go upstairs and you talk to the Lord about this. And when you're ready to come down and talk to me, we'll talk about it then. <laughs> well, the little girl goes upstairs for a while and then she comes back down and she's a little bit, you know, calmer now. Mom, I'm sorry. And, and mom, I think you're right. I think Satan did put into my mind to pull Bobby's hair. But mom, I have to tell you, when it came to the spitting, the spitting was all my idea. I did that all on my own. And it's just a funny little story I've always enjoyed because you, you have all the forces that create human conflict. Here we are, we're these beings created in the image of God, wanting always to be loved and always want to give love. And yet we have this, this collision. We have dark spiritual forces. Satan enters into the Garden of Eden creates havoc between God and man and man and man. You know, Adam and Eve no longer trust God. They can no longer trust each other. All of a sudden, conflict becomes a way of life. You and I know that you, you don't live very long in this world before you encounter conflict. You encounter conflict early in life, you and I both, and then you spend, we spend the rest of our life trying to figure out how to resolve conflict. I want to share with you in this series of messages today some practical constructs about uh, how God has guided us and directed us to enhance our relationships. Remember, we said last week, the purpose of all relationships is that God wants us to grow. He wants to stretch us. He wants to rid us of our selfishness so that we can learn to love the way He Himself loves. And that requires specific contexts that pull on us in different ways. And in that process, we end up running into conflict. So we're going to spend a lot of time in Scripture today. In fact, this message is going to be mostly Scripture. I strongly, strongly urge you, get the notes. I've got all these verses printed out for you. You can have them. You can internalize them. Better yet, you can use them the next time you get in a conflict in which they might be useful. So I want to start out by reading uh, to you. By the way, the series is called... Um, tug of war slash love. You could call it tug of love because love is like a tug of war. Even though we want it all the time and want to give it all the time, we struggle in the process. In Psalm 133, 1, it says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. God loves it. Here's where we need to start. God loves it when people get along. He loves it when people resolve conflict and are reconciled to one another, when they are restored to harmonious relationships. It gives His heart joy seeing us get along because that's all part of learning to love the way God loves, loving one another. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, which makes clear that someone's going to have to be working to make peace. Peace isn't going to be automatic. Uh, resolving conflict is a massive part of this. Now I want to start by, by just saying when it comes to resolving conflict, here's the bad news. The bad news is God Himself tells us in this life we need to have realistic confines about this. We, we, we need to have some realistic thoughts about this. Let me read you this verse from Romans chapter 12 verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Notice what it says. If it's possible, which indicates that it's not always possible. If it's possible, live at peace with everyone as much as it depends on you, on me. So we need to start with the bad news. Here's the bad news. Not all conflict in this life, even amongst we that are Christ followers, not all conflict can be resolved. It's tragic. It's sad. We don't like it. It's uncomfortable for us. But the truth of the matter is, we cannot resolve all conflict. Let me go further. This is a terrible side of this, terrible truth. 
The person that cares the least about the will of God, that person carries the most power in conflict. The person that cares about the Word of God and will of God, they're, they're going to want to go the extra mile to try to resolve it, to try to work at it. The person that cares less, they hold the power. This is the sad part about resolving conflict. Not all conflict can be resolved. Now, last week I introduced to you the uh, what I'm calling the six relational context. God puts us in six kind of platforms so that he can stretch us, develop us to learn how to love like he loves. I'm going to call them today not just relational context, but relational levels, because there truly are differing levels of love that God wants us to develop in each of these areas. Let me go through them with you. The first one is this, it's family. And after uh, family, we have uh, co-workers. We spend a lot of our time with co-workers. After, after co-workers, we have friends. After friends, we have what I'm calling strangers. And these are acquaintances. They might be people we see regularly, but we don't necessarily know them on a very personal level. After that, we have enemies. And Jesus said, yes, we can even love enemies. He said we can love our enemies by doing good to them, by blessing them when they curse us, and by praying for them. And then we finally have fellow Christians, which is a whole different kind of relating and a whole different kind of love. So there's six different levels. Call them context or levels of loving. You can see how this works. The family level, husbands, wives, parents, kids, you know, and all like that, that's a more intimate, that's a more intense level of love. When you go to co-workers, it's not as intense, but it can be intense. And then when you go from there to friends, it's easier, breezier, not as intense. And then from there to strangers and acquaintances, it's a different kind of love, but it's still love that we should give and that we want to receive in return. So here's a statement I want to share with you. Love, according to God, love is always reasonable and operable as a principle. Love is always a reasonable, operable principle. In other words, God says the universe of beings that are made in His image, angels and humans, beings that have free will, mind, reason, emotions, you know, and all that imagination, the only way we can live in harmony is if we are governed by love. And love is always reasonable. It is simply seeking the highest well-being and happiness, the highest good of the other person, as God gives us revelation to understand that. Love is always an operable principle. Jesus said even with enemies, Luke 6, 27, how do you love an enemy? You can't love them completely like you would a family member, although sometimes we have to learn to love family members as enemies, meaning that sometimes we have to just do them good, do them all the good we can, uh, you know, bless them even though they may be cursing us, and then we have to pray for them. So these are the six levels of, or six contexts where God wants to stretch us so that we learn how to love the way He loves, and there are also six different levels of love. So let's look now as we move into this, this subject, intense subject of resolving conflict, let's start by looking at some uh, reconciliation considerations. Listen to some verses. These are from Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 3. It says, It is to one's honor to avoid strife. So here's, here's what God says to us, number one. You don't have to fight every fight. You don't have to get in every argument. It, it's an honor to deliberately avoid an argument. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 16 says, It's why, or the wise, ignore insults. Now, we all have different capacities for this, but the older, the more Christ-like we become, hopefully the more capacity we develop to just ignore an insult. Well, why should we let an insult get to us? I mean, I'm not saying that we shouldn't stand up for ourselves at times, but frankly, the only thing that matters is the truth. And God knows the truth about you, the truth about me. His opinion is what really matters. And so sometimes we can avoid a conflict rather than resolve it. We can just avoid it by just absorbing, absorbing an insult, not taking it too personally. It goes on to say in Proverbs 17, 14, it's hard to stop a quarrel once it starts, so don't let it begin. We all know that feeling. You know, that conversation takes this weird turn, and we're like, uh-oh, uh-oh. And so here's God telling us, when you feel that conversation taking that turn, stop. Because once you let this quarrel start, it is really, really hard to put it back in the box. So these are some reconciliation considerations. One more from Proverbs chapter 26, verse 17. It says, I love this one. It says, interfering in someone else's argument, interfering in someone else's argument is as foolish as yanking a dog's ears. So God is telling us simply, mind your own business. Now there are, there is a context, we're going to look at this later, where we should be involved in helping with a conflict. 
But for the most part, God says, you've got enough stuff in your own life to deal with. Don't get involved in someone else's. So these are just foundational considerations for reconciliation and resolving conflict. Now, I'm going to turn you to what I'm calling reconciliation complicators. The, these are the fly in the ointment. The, these are the, the problems that make, unfortunately, some conflict impossible to resolve. Now, now, I want to say this to you so that you don't go in a bad direction. Many of the conflicts that you and I sometimes feel are impossible to resolve, if we go about it God's way, they turn out to be very possible to resolve. But it is true, sometimes in this life, there are some conflicts that we cannot resolve. Now, I'm going to give you some, some complicating conditions that individuals have that make it very, very hard to resolve conflict. Here we go. Again, we're just going to let God speak to us. Proverbs 10, 12. It says, Hatred stirs up conflict. If a person has hatred in their heart, it is going to be incredibly hard to resolve conflict with them. They, they are just going to be prone towards arguments and conflict. Hatred stirs up conflict. Proverbs 13, 10, it says, Pride leads to conflict. When a person is proud, they're usually simultaneously insecure. They're trying to compare themselves favorably to others. They try to cut others down, hold themselves up, and they tend to be quarrelsome and overly sensitive because of this. It's going to be very hard to resolve conflict with people that are proud. They're not going to listen. They're not going to, they're not going to accept that they might have some responsibility in it. Proverbs 17, 19, it says, Those that love quarreling give offense. You know it and I know it. We don't know why, and there can be many reasons why, not always the person's fault, to be frank. But there are people that simply love a quarrel. They simply love to be engaged in combative situations. I think personally it makes some of them feel significant. They feel a connection. Maybe they, they learned it in a kind of a skewed upbringing. But there are people that just love quarreling. Proverbs 26, 21, it says, The contentious man is apt to kindle strife. It's going to be really hard to resolve conflict with a, the contentious person. There are some people, they are just stinking argumentative. You say hi, they'll say hello. You say black, they'll say white. You say it's today, they'll say it's tomorrow. It, they don't even know why. They're just contentious. And sometimes they mean no ill, but it's going to be hard to resolve conflict with the contentious person. Proverbs 29, 22 says, An angry person stirs up conflict. There are people, we know them, they are just the angry person. Once again, it's not even necessarily all their fault. They don't even necessarily know why they're angry, but they walk around all the time with that anger kind of right up to the mouth level, and all it takes is the slightest little circumstance or word to jostle them, and they're like, um, you know, water that just spills out, and only in their case, it's anger that comes spilling out. The anger is always right on the surface level, ready to spill out. And these angry people, these hostile people, it's going to be very hard, not impossible, but very hard to resolve conflict with them. It goes on to say in Proverbs 29, 11, it says, fools give full vent to their rage. God says some people are fools, and he says the way you know a fool when you see one is they just blow sky high. They give full vent. They don't hold anything back. You know, when they go off, they go off. It is very hard to resolve conflict with someone that gives full vent to their rage because, you know, you can't have a, a, an open conversation in that kind of a case. Proverbs 20, um, excuse me, Proverbs 25, 28 says, a person who lacks self-control, if you read the rest of that proverb, says that they're like a city without walls. There are people that have not matured sufficiently emotionally. Therefore, they are still like children. Their emotions run them. Their moods are up and down and all over. They have no self-control. And when you are trying to resolve conflict with someone that has not matured and doesn't have self-control, it can be really hard near to impossible. So these are some reconciliation complicators. Now all of these conditions do not make it impossible to resolve conflict. If we pray, if we seek God, if we pray for that person, if we're patient, if we wait, if we watch, if we seek their good, in time God does some extraordinary things. So please. Don't label people and don't, don't think that perhaps some of these may not apply to ourselves. So, nevertheless, we need to be aware of these, what I call, reconciliation complicators. Now I'm going to take you on the positive side of this. These are what I call reconciliation preconditions. If you and I are going to resolve conflict, this is 
This is the, the inward attitude we have to be in. This is the approach we have to take if we're going to have a, the best chance, best case scenario of resolving conflict. Okay, in the book of the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2, it says, Always be humble. Humble. You come into trying to resolve a conflict, you better take a humble posture. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults. I have faults, you have faults, everybody has them. Make allowance. Don't magnify them. Minimize them. Make allowance for each other's faults because of your love. In the 32nd verse of the same fourth chapter, it says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Listen, number one most powerful principle of resolving conflict is my willingness and your willingness to forgive. Uh, this, this, is, this is of God. God is a forgiving being. We are made in His image and it delights His heart when we start behaving like He does and we just give each other some slack and we forgive each other. Let me read that verse. He says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as, Christ, as in Christ God forgave you. How much should we forgive? The way that God forgives us. That's pretty extensive. So when we're going to move toward resolving a conflict, we need to be humble, we need to be gentle, we need to be patient, we need to allow that other people have faults, we have faults, we need to be compassionate and kind, and we need to be forgiving. We cannot resolve conflict without choosing to be forgiving. And to be forgiving is to be like God. It's a part of love. It's just a manifestation of love. So those are what I call the reconciliation preconditions. Now I want to go on to a reconciliation action plan that Jesus Himself gave us. Now this reconciliation action plan gives us a model uh, of what to do when, when a conflict actually arises. This is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. I'm going to read it to you. Jesus says, If your fellow believer sins against you, you must go to that one privately and attempt to resolve the matter. Notice that word resolve. You're not going to that person privately to bawl them out. You're not going to give them a piece of your mind that you can't afford to give away. You're not going there to prove you're right or to have a victory. You are going to them privately. You're not embarrassing them. You're not picking up the phone and talking to 10 people. You're not texting 20 people. You, you know, you're, you're going to them privately. It's between them and you and God at this point. Go to them. You take the initiative. You, I, must take the initiative. Go to them privately and attempt to resolve the matter. If he, if she responds, listen to this, your relationship is restored. The goal in every conflict resolution process is I want to just restore the relationship. I want to have reconciliation. I don't want a victory. I don't want vindication. Uh, we must want a, a restoration. We, we must want to go into it wanting to resolve the conflict, solve the problem, attack the problem, not attack the person. It goes, Jesus goes on to say this. He says, okay, so you've made this attempt, verse 16, but it didn't work. But if his heart is closed to you, then go to him again, taking one or two others with you. Uh, you'll be fulfilling what the Scripture teaches when it says, every word may be verified by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he, if she refuses to listen, this is when you've brought in help, um, then share the issue with the entire church in hopes. Now listen to this, this is important, in hopes of restoration. And what does he mean share it with the entire church? Does he mean share it with all, all the 2,000 people at once? No. He's saying it's a, it's a kind of a, a, a model, it's, it's, a, it's a prototype, it's a group of leaders, let's say. You're sharing it with the church at large. But you're doing it not to excommunicate them, and that's usually what's, what's pushed in this passage. No, you're doing this because you, you are still hoping for restoration that now a body from the church can go and appeal with them and say, come on, you know, you're, you, you, can you just at least give this person a pass? Can't, can't we work this out? Let's talk about it more, whatever it might be. Now remember what I said at the very beginning, not all conflict is resolvable. Even the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, who were dear missionary friends together, they had a conflict in Acts chapter 15 in which was so severe they had to go their separate ways. They still served Jesus. They still served God. They still served other people. But they couldn't work together anymore. So not all conflict in this life, even with the best effort and intent, is going to be resolvable. So Jesus says if he, if he listens, if he refuses to listen in, then share the issue with the entire church in hopes of restoration. 
If he still refuses to respond, disregarding the fellowship of his church family, you must disregard him as though he were an outsider on the same level as an unrepentant sinner. What does this mean? Is this dis, you know, just cutting this person necessarily out of your life? No. How, how do we treat people that are apart from Christ? We treat them lovingly. We, we try to still draw them back to God. This passage is not saying that you just completely cut this person off altogether. It's saying you just have to change your style of interaction with them. Now you have to love them maybe like an enemy. Remember what Jesus said, Luke 6, 27. We can even love the enemy. How do you love the enemy? You do all the good for them you can. You bless them even though they're cursing you, and you pray for them. So you may have to change your tactics when you say, okay, they're behaving like an unbeliever, so I'm going to have to love them now on the level of an unbeliever. It is not necessarily saying that you give up or cut this person out of your life or that you know, they're, they're cut out of the fellowship forever. Okay, so Jesus gives us a beautiful model here, and it's a model, unfortunately, that's rarely observed. What, what I see all too often, and I've seen in my multiple years, decades now in the ministry, is this, is that people say, oh yeah, I, I, I know I should go to that person, but I just don't feel comfortable. Oh, that person might, might get angry, or, or I just, I'm just not good with conflict. So what do they do? They go and they run and attend 10, 12, 14 other people. They polarize them. They try to reinforce themselves to feel right, and the conflict never gets resolved. You've now muddied the perception of other people about this person who's never had their, their honest day in court, so to speak. It's not the way. Jesus wouldn't have said to you, to me, to all of us, you take initiative and you go to the person privately. He wouldn't tell us to do anything that he doesn't empower us to do. Believers, we need to grow up. We need to stop acting like children saying, oh, I just can't. Well, we, we can tell other people about the conflict, so why don't we do what God says and go to the person privately? And go, like I said, humbly, gently, with compassion, with kindness, with forbearance, with forgiveness in your heart. And say, man, let's try to work this out. The relationship is more important than the issue. Let's, we'll tackle the issue, but, but, but let's, let's, above all, let's agree that we, we want, if possible, to just be brothers again, sisters again, whatever the case may be. So that's Jesus workable model, or His reconciliation action plan. Now, I want to take you to what I'm calling five reconciliation catalyzers. The, these, are, these are attitudes, practices that, that sort of just give an a, a energy boost. They, they get the process moving in real time. So when you and I, when we are going to go to the person, we're going to sit down privately, we're going to have the talk, this, this is the real step-by-step -step kind of action plan. So reconciliation catalyzer, catalyzers. Number one, timing. Timing. I've learned a lesson through the years. I want to reconcile things immediately, usually too quickly for me. And the truth that I've learned about myself is that even though it's hard for me to hold back, I usually don't do very good. I'm, I'm still too emotional at that point. I've learned with me, this may not be true of you, but I've learned with me, I, I, a 48-hour rule is a really good rule. I calm down, my perspective gets more clear, some things that I might have thought were wise to say, I now may think are unwise to say. But don't go further than 48 hours, because what I know about me is this, if I go much further than 48 hours, I start getting cowardly, because I don't like conflict, I just don't enjoy it, I don't know many people that do. And so, if we let it go too far, the likelihood is we're never going to go through the reconciliation process. We're never going to actually try to resolve it. We'll just let it go. Sometimes we internalize bitterness and, and it's, it's unfortunate. So, timing. Listen to what Ecclesiastes says. It says, there's a time to be silent and a time to speak. I need to prayerfully say, God, is it time for me to be silent now? Is it time for me to speak? But please listen to my initial plea. 48 hours might be okay. We start drifting past that, it's highly unlikely we're going to be able to uh, have the courage to follow through and resolve this in, in a competent fashion. So the first, the first reconciliation catalyzer is timing. The second uh, catalyzer is listening. Listen to what it says in James chapter 1, verse 6. It says, everyone, or I think it's verse 16, uh, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Let me read it again. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So, 
James is saying that the first thing, if I'm going to go into a process where I want to resolve conflict, I've got to go in there with the notion, I'm going to listen. I'm going to let this other person talk. I'm going to try to really hear them. I'm going to focus on them. And, and focused listening, many of us know, is not easy. You know, our mind starts to wander. We start to think about what we're going to say. They may say something that we think is inaccurate. We want to respond to it. I mean, there's all kinds of things that happen. It is extremely hard to just stay in a focused listening mode. But that's the first step. I make sure my timing is as, is as correct as I can under God, understand that it is. And I go in with the idea of first, I, I want to hear your side. I want to hear why did this bother you? What did you hear me say? What, what do you think I did? Help me understand. So that's the first part. After the listening, and the goal of the listening is to understand. I want to understand the person. I want to understand how this looked to them, how this felt to them, what's bothering them about this. I, w I want them to know it matters to me what the way whatever has occurred impacted them. Listen to this verse from Proverbs chapter 18, verse 2. It says, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Sometimes there are people that will encounter that all they want to do is just tell you what's on their mind. They are completely uninterested to understanding you. But that should not be our attitude when we are trying to resolve conflict. We should listen and we're listening to the person because we're praying while we're listening. We're praying for understanding. God, help me to understand this person. What are they afraid of? What are they feeling? How do they feel threatened? Um, what is it that's, that's under the, the surface? You know, how, how can I understand them? Please give me understanding of them. So it's only a fool that's only concerned about blowing out what's in their mind and heart. But the wise, those that resolve conflict, we seek understanding. So we need to, first of all, seek to, to, be, seek to understand the other person first. So we go into this conflict resolution process saying, I want to understand you first. Seek to understand the other person first. Then, of course, we finally get to the process where it's time for us to, uh, to communicate. And... Uh, that's where we seek to be understood at that point. And Genesis, or excuse me, in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1, it says, A gentle answer quiets anger. This has been proven in psychological testing. It's really hard to do. If someone's raising their voice at you, man, it is really hard not to raise your voice back. Having said that, if we can... If the other person is getting amped up, and that happens, happens to anybody, if we can stay quieter or if we can stay silent, at times it's just better. Just, just, just be silent. Um, it tends to allow that person to uh, kind of get what they need to get off their chest, out of their minds, get, get, it, get it said, you know, just kind of lose some of the energy. And even though you might not be able to reconcile or, or resolve the conflict immediately, uh, all things considered, that's not a bad approach. So... First seek to understand, now you're going to turn the corner and I'm going to seek to be understood. I'm going to start to communicate once I'm allowed to communicate, if I'm allowed to communicate, if you're allowed to communicate, okay, but I'm going to start out gentle. I'm going to be gentle. Proverbs 16, 21, it says this, it says, kind speech increases persuasiveness. I'm not only going to be gentle, ton tonal quality, I'm not only going to be softer tonal quality, hopefully, and it's really hard to do. But I'm going to try to be kind in what I say. I'm, I'm going to try to think through my words. I've first listened carefully. I've sought to understand. Now I want to seek to be understood. But I'm l much more likely to be understood if I'm coming across kind. I'm going to be more persuasive. Not that I'm trying to manipulate somebody. Not that I'm trying to control them. But I'm going to be, you're going to be more persuasive if I'm choosing kind words. Uh, pleasant words, Proverbs 16 says, promote instruction. Now, again, please hear me out. In the heat of conflict, this does not work. Most of these principles do not work. In fact, in fact, let, let, me, let me throw something out to you. Um, there, there are some relationships that have deteriorated to a point where friction is immediate and fierce. And the, the emotions just go back and forth and the words go back and forth like, like a... Like a you know, Olympic ping pong match at blinding speed. And the anger is out of control. So a technique that works, it absolutely works if, if you're in a situation and you, you just want to try to stop that cycle 
Um, there, there is a process of work. Now, like everything else I've said to you in this, it will only work if both people abide by it, if both people care enough that they want to resolve the conflict. Here, here's the way the process works. If a conversation starts and it starts getting tense, one or the other is allowed at any time to do a physical timeout signal like they do in football. When the physical timeout signal is given, the agreement in advance is this. You will leave the proximity where you're at. You'll go to separate places in the house. You'll, ha you'll have a notebook ready and prepared. You'll be apart from each other for at least 20 minutes. You'll write down in your notebook what was happening, what were we talking about, what was I feeling, why was I upset, what did I think was going on. And then you make a time a day later where you will sit down and you will discuss. When you sit down, you'll, you'll have turns. Person A goes first. They get up to five minutes to explain what they felt, what was going on. Then they have to stop, non-interruption. Then person B gets to talk five, up to five minutes, non-interruption. The conversation goes back and forth like that. What this does is it slows down, it forces a slowdown in the emotional cycle. Now, now here's the thing, <laughs> here's, here's, the, here's the sad truth, you know? There's all kinds of hand signals you can give people, aren't there? If I go time out or you go time out and somebody else decides they're going to give a different kind of a hand signal, maybe they're going to use that third finger signal. No reconciliation, no resolving conflict. This process works. It allows people to understand one another. It allows people to use, to use conflict to better understand one another and actually build intimacy. The conflict leads to a deeper understanding, but it's painfully, agonizingly slow. It's, it's, it's onerous, it's arduous, you know, people don't like it. But once we get into that cycle where it's fast and furious and very angry, this is what has to happen. It's almost like somebody that has to go and be put in rehab for a while. You have to do some artificial things. You have to create some boundaries, some structures to get it back on a reasonable level again. Okay, and then the ultimate goal after you've communicated is reconnecting. Listen to this verse from chapter 15, verse 7 in the book of Romans in the New Testament. It says, so open your hearts to one another as Christ has opened his heart to you that God will be glorified. This is the goal of resolving conflict, that at the end of it we've attacked the problem, not each other, and we've literally come to the place. And it can feel difficult and it's, the emotion may go up and down, but we come to the place where, where once again, truly, my heart's open to you again. Your heart's open to me again. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna track together as whatever that relational level is. We're gonna track as husbands and wives in love again. We're gonna track as parents and kids in love again, grandparents, grandkids, whatever it may be. We're gonna track as coworkers, you know, again, as friends again. We're gonna track as strangers in the community that maybe we were rude to or they were rude to us, we're going to work it out there, whatever it may be, we're, we're going to restore, we're going to open our hearts again, them to us, us to them. We're going to accept one another the way that God accepts us and He accepts us in all of our imperfection. With full knowledge, with full knowledge, we're going to mess up again. With full knowledge as human beings, this is not going to likely be the last time we have to resolve a conflict. In fact, I should have said this at the beginning, Conflict resolution should be something that we just accept as a way of life because it must be. Because unfortunately, the will of God is not done by every human being on this planet all the time. And until the, the will of God is done by every human being on this planet all the time, and every angelic being in the universe all the time, conflict will be the reality. And God says, blessed are the peacemakers. The sooner I, you, we learn how to resolve conflict and make peace. Uh, the better off we'll be, the better off everybody around us will be. I'm going to close with that image. You know, remember the, the little girl, little boy, you know, mom, here's her two kids. They're fussing and fighting. And, you know, so as a parent, uh, you that are parents, you, you remember what this is like. It, it's one of the most miserable things on earth when your kids are furious at each other and they're fighting and they, they might even say to each other, you know, I hate you, you know, and all that kind of thing. It just, it breaks your heart as a parent. But... The other side is equally euphoric and blissful. As a parent, when you see your kids getting along and just being kind to one another and generous and laughing and enjoying one another, and when they have a conflict, you see them actually get over it and forgive and go back playing again, it is truly one of the most blessed experiences that we have as parents. 
Keep that image burned into your heart, into your mind. Our Father who is in heaven, He so delights when you and I are willing to at least attempt to resolve the conflicts in our life and to reconcile with those that we have had conflict with. Let me read you that verse that I started out with. How good and how pleasant it is, says Psalm 133, 1, how good and how pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Love is always a reasonable, operable principle. We can always love, even if it's only loving as the enemy, Luke 6, 27. I'm going to do you good, any good that I can do for you. I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to pray for you. I wonder if there are some conflicts in your life that you have perhaps written off prematurely. I'm not saying that we can resolve them all. You've heard me all through this message saying, I know better than that. But I wonder if there might be some that have felt so hopeless we just haven't sufficiently cried out to God and found that power that He gives when we rely on Him to raise things back from the dead, dead relationships, dead, dead hopes that we have for those relationships. I just wonder if some of us maybe, the Spirit of God is, is, is urging us to reconsider some relationships that we had pretty much thought this one just needs to be let go in this lifetime. Now, I'm not saying everyone is like that. Some, some, in fact, do need to be let go. But maybe there's some that God's saying, no, 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 if you just go back at this thing, this thing that seems so dead, that seems so horrible, that seems so miserable, I, I'm right ready to turn this around and turn it into something so extraordinarily beautiful that you won't even be able to understand it. I have a message coming up in this series, and it's a message about restoring feelings. God is an expert in restoring dead feelings. One of the things that confuses us as adults is we feel like that once our feelings change for someone, usually it's because of conflict, that, that it's dead, it's gone, it can never be recovered. That is absolutely the devil's lie. That is not true. And in a message coming up, I'm, I'm going to share with you what God says about how feelings even as fragile as they are and as changed as they are, they can be restored. So maybe there's a relationship God's urging you to reopen your heart to and to start maybe a conflict resolution process. Maybe some of us have never even had a process. I, I plead with you like I did at the beginning of this message. Take the notes that go with this message because there is so much scripture for you to take, absorb, internalize, and utilize as you actually start to attempt to resolve conflict. Lastly, don't get discouraged if you attempt to resolve some conflict and it doesn't work first time, second time, third time. Don't get discouraged. Just keep trusting God. Uh, you might have to learn to love at one of the lesser levels, but you, are still love, you can still love and you can wait on God and you can wait on the person. So keep those thoughts in mind and I, and I hope that uh, any decision the Spirit of God is putting on your heart, you'll follow through on. Let's pray, FCF. Father, we, we are grateful that you are the God of reconciliation. You, you, you own that as being your heartbeat. You seek to always reconcile, to resolve conflict. Conflict between ourselves and you. Uh, you try to win back our trust even to the point of going to the cross. How much more should we be open-hearted to reconciling with one another? Help us, help us to have a spirit of forgiveness, a spirit of hope, a spirit of courage to be willing to go through the process just like you taught us. We ask all these things, Lord Jesus, in your holy name. Amen.